Let's go ahead and set up that problem then that we just mentioned. So we've got these elastic blocks. Now I'm drawing them from the side and the dimensions that we're gonna use are gonna be 20. These are all gonna be in millimeters. 20 millimeters this way, 80 millimeters this way, and then into the board, they're going to be 40. So maybe we should sketch it like this. So that's what it would look like if we're taking a look at one of the blocks. So it's gonna be 40 millimeters this way. So that's the block. Now I'm gonna redraw it though, just from the side, it's a little bit easier for us to see that. And then it's got the loading by this kind of hoop sort of structure, like so. And again, that is rigid, and that was 2,800 Newtons. And then there's another block over here. So it almost looks like some sort of a tuning fork or an arch or what have you, so it's rigid there. It somehow adhered to these blocks, and those blocks are fixed to the wall, like so. So now we've got the dimensions. Again, that's 20, and then this height is going to be 80. Now, as it's loaded, then, all of the resistance comes because the blocks shear. So the load is resisted by blocks in shear. So what we mean by that is let's use dashed lines to denote the displaced state. So they shear down. It's like taking an eraser and putting it on a gl glued table and pushing tangentially. So it's gonna move down like this and like this. And then this side does the exact same thing because it's symmetric and it moves down. And here's what we're given. We're actually given the experimental evidence. So we find then that it goes down eight millimeters. And then the question is, find G. So if we go back to our hierarchy, we have displacement to strain to stress to force. So in this case, what do we have? Well, in this case, our displacement is the eight millimeters. So the U in this case is the eight millimeters down. That leads to not an epsilon now, but a gamma. So what is that gamma going to be? Well, the gamma is right in here. That's the angle. So that's the change in angle between two lines that were originally perpendicular. So that is the gamma that's generated by that. So the gamma that we have, so again, it looks like this and like this. This is eight and this is 20. And that's gonna be then gamma. Now we've made the assumption then that that angle is small. So what that means is you can get the angle just by taking opposite over adjacent. So gamma is equal to simply eight divided by 20. And that's gonna be 0 0.4 radians. Now, I will say right now, that's not exactly a small angle. So 0 0.4 radians, remember it's about uh, pi radians is 180. So what we, uh, so that's about three. So we divide this roughly by what, seven or so. So that's more like, you know, uh, 25 degrees, something like that. And so that's not exactly a small angle. So we're kind of pushing the border of what we would consider to be a small angle. So we'll say maybe a qualifier here, not really a small angle. In fact, we would probably do better in this case by taking uh, the actual arc tangent of eight divided by 20. Now it's supposed to be give us the same thing, but that would be more exact. But we're not gonna bother doing that because I've told you in this class, you can always assume that the angles are small. So when you get something like 0 0.4, you can make the assumption that I'm allowing you to say that that's gonna be a small angle. And uh, we're just gonna kind of take that as a fact in this case. All right, so we've gone, notice, we went from displacement to strain. Then we can go from strain to stress. Tau is next. So what's that going to be? Well, we've got the tau then is going to be equal to G gamma. That's one of the ones that we wanna to commit to memory. Now, we don't know this and we don't know this. But what we can do is substitute in our value for this. So we've got the tau is equal to 0 0.4, that's our gamma, times g. 
So that's our intermediate step. So now we're at this location. Then the other thing that we realize is that we can integrate the shear stress to get the shear force. So the next step, we integrate tau to get a V. So what does that mean? Well, it means that we've got a force coming down like this of 2,800. And then each block has to resist half of that. So there's a resultant shear force at the, at the wall of 1,400 newtons and 1,400 like this. So the shear stresses that we have, in fact, let's blow this up. Let's look at the side view of that, like so. That's going to be our 0.4 G, but let's write it in as tau. There's a field of arrows acting on that face that's going up because that has to integrate to resist the applied load. So that is the tau, and that's integrating to give us 1,400. So now we can just use, so we've got that guy there. So now all we need to realize is that we've got to get the dimensions right. Remember, this is the 80, and then this distance is the 40. That's the 40 millimeters that we had earlier. So now we can say that to get the 1,400, and by the way, now we're on this step. We're integrating the shear stress to get the shear force. So I say that 1,400, that's the force. I integrate the shear stress. Well, in this case, the shear stress is uniform. So all we have to do is multiply that shear stress by the area. So that's going to be tau times A. Now, this is where you have to be a little bit careful because you have to ask yourself, okay, over what area is that shear stress acting? So that's going to require a pretty good uh, understanding of your statics. So we slice the blocks at the wall, and that's the area. And it's equal to the 80 times the 40. But if we convert that, that's equal to uh, 0.08 times 0.04. So we're converting that to meters. So make sure that you do that particular conversion. So that's going to give us 0 0.4 times G. That's tau. And then the area is 0 0.08 times 0 0.04. And that's all equal to 1400. So now we have one equation, one unknown. This is the only term that is not known. And so we can just solve for that. We just do the arithmetic and we find that G is equal to 1.1 MPA. Like so. And then if we multiply that by uh, the 0 0.4, if we go ahead and do that, then we find that the shear stress, so the tau, Remember, that was the 0.4 G, and that turns out to be equal to 437.5 kPa. So that's what we have on our field of arrows. We've got all of these little guys on this side, and they're 437.5 kPa on that side of the shear block. And then there's another one on the left-hand side. Now, this is a great problem. Uh, why? So great problem. The reason it's a great problem is, first off, it takes us from displacement to strain to stress to force. Now, remember, those are only symbols. In this case, the U is actually the drop, the delta, right? It was like here, and it's moved down like so. So there's a downward drop that led to a shear strain. If there's a shear strain, there's a shear stress. Tau is equal to G gamma. If there is a shear stress, we integrate that to get a shear force, and that has to balance the applied load. So going from delta to gamma, that's a kinematic argument. It goes down like this, and we just use the physical nature and the physical relationship between displacement and the shear strain. This, the gamma, and the tau, that's simply tau is equal to G gamma. And then the last link that we've got 
is that V is equal to tau multiplied by A. So there are three one-liners. And they make the entire link between the displacement and the applied force. So it is really a great problem, and I think it's kind of a, a nice anniversary because it is one of the first ones where we take something from, I load the solid and it deforms, load the solid, it deforms. That deformation leads to a strain. That strain is linked to a stress via a constitutive law. That stress, when integrated, gives a force that balances the applied load. And that's basically the little story that we mentioned on the very first day of class. And now we have seen it play out. So I would really make sure you understand this one. So I'm just going to say study this problem. It is a great FE problem. It's a great uh, Civ 360 problem. It's a great PhD qualifying exam problem because there's a lot involved in it. You have to know really what you're doing. And I think the trickiest thing for most students is going to be figuring out which distances you're going to use. So which distance do you use to calculate gamma? Which uh, distance do you use for the area over which the shear stress acts and so on? So take a look at this, give it a little bit of study, and uh, you'll be in great shape. Now we're at 1130, uh, 11 minutes, 30 seconds. And since I owe you a few seconds, this is a great time to end. Uh, our lecture. So that's it for part D. Good work. See you next time.